Hello and welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. My name is Rory McClure. I'm the pastor of Parkside Church and I want to welcome you to this weekly YouTube service. I know that many of you would love to be able to come along to this church. You've been faithful members of this church for many years and each week I like to try and show a different shot of the church just to remind you of where it is that we can normally meet. But for others of you, you you're new to this church you've never actually had a chance to visit here. And praise God that our viewer numbers have increased under the lockdown. Praise God that there's more of you that have been blessed by this ministry. That's a real encouragement to this small church on the south coast of England. We're in Little Hampton in Sussex. We're a seaside town, but we're wonderfully blessed with many godly and mature saints who love God and love to meet together. If you'd like to join us for public worship, it would be really encouraging for us. We normally meet at 10.30 under lockdown conditions, but as we approach Easter, I'm anticipating that more people will want to come. The good news is that the uh, infection figures are going down. The other good news is that many people have now had two flu shots and they're feeling a lot more secure, a lot more confident about coming out but as Christians. The most special time of the year is Easter. And so I'm anticipating for Easter, we'll have more people wanting to attend public worship. So let me just give you uh, an uh, advance warning about the services that we have. Uh, this service that I'm recording at the moment is going to go out on the 21st of March. And on the 21st of March, if you've watched this very early on Sunday morning, maybe even late on the Saturday evening on the 20th of March, you can still make it at 10.30. And it will be 10.30 again on Palm Sunday on the 28th of March. There's only 30 places, a maximum of 30 places available. So please do book if you can make those, either of those. But as we approach Easter week, We've got Monday, Thursday, the night on which Jesus was betrayed, the night where he sat with his disciples and celebrated the Last Supper, where he celebrated that glorious communion meal. And so we want to meet around the Lord's table in remembrance of him. We want to feast on all that he's provided for us. And for us who love Jesus, it's been a heartache that for a year now we haven't been able to receive the communion. And so this is our first opportunity. 7 p.m. on the 1st of April, Monday, Thursday, we'll be meeting in the church around this table. And we, there we will meet with Jesus. There we will feast on him. But I know some of you aren't able to come out on a Sunday evening. So we're also going to have a second service on Good Friday. On Good Friday at 11 a.m. we're going to have a service. And again, please book up for that. There's only 30 places available at the most, but we'll meet around the Lord's table and we'll remember what our Lord suffered as he hung upon that cross. And then we have Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is on the 4th of April and this is the beginning of our two services in the morning. If there's plenty of people that turn up to both services from then on, all the way through April, May, June, we'll carry on until the lockdown restriction uh, um, measures have been lightened. We'll carry on with two morning services. Again, restricted to 30 people, uh, uh, certainly over the first few months. But we'll be meeting at 10 a.m., not 10.30, 10 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. So two morning services. Our services typically have been around 40 minutes long. They're much shorter than normal, but we still sing God's praises. We pray to him. We hear from the word of God through all of those services. But we want to remember this Easter Sunday, Jesus is risen. We have so much to encourage us. And we'll do that as we come to God and worship, as we come and hear from him in this opening psalm. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 116 and really helps us to anticipate the coming of Easter. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of shale laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. 
our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of my salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let's do that now as we join all the saints of God in the heavenly Jerusalem and sing God's praises and worship him. We're going to do that in our opening hymn, which is Unto Thee All Praise Be Given. It's a lovely old Welsh tune, beautifully sung here for us, but what a thrilling song to remind us of the goodness of our God and of his salvation. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we love you. We love you because you had mercy on us, because you've heard our voice and our pleas for mercy, because you inclined your ear to us and you had mercy. You brought us to Jesus. You forgave us our sins. You restored us. You blessed us. You gave us eternal life. And we want to love you and worship you. Therefore, we will call on you as long as we live. Lord, thank you that you saved us from the snares of death. death. Thank you, dear Lord, that you rescues us from the pangs of shale. Lord, we know that the wages of sin is death, but we know that Jesus paid those wages in full on our behalf. We thank you for rescuing him from the grave and from resurrecting him. And by that resurrection, you have guaranteed our own resurrection. Thank you that you understand us in our suffering and anguish. Thank you, dear Lord, that when we call on your holy name, you deliver us, you deliver our souls, you rescue us from death, and you show us that you are gracious, righteous, 
and merciful. Lord, each and every one of us knows a time when we have been brought low. Some of us are struggling, having been brought low, but you have saved us. You have rescued us. And so, Lord, in the midst of our anguish, we return our souls to your rest because you have dealt bountifully with us. We praise you and worship you, O Lord, our God. You've delivered us from our souls from death. You have made, you've wiped away the tears from our eyes. You have prevented our feet from stumbling and you've enabled us to walk righteously in your presence in the land of the living. We're humbled and amazed at that glorious transformation, but you deserve more praise and more worship. What can we render to you for all the blessings and benefits you've given to us? All we can do, dear Lord, is gather round your table and lift the cup of salvation and call on your holy name to pay our vows before you in the presence of all your people and to give you the worship that you deserve, to offer to you that sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on your name and to love you and worship you and to praise your name. Oh, Heavenly Father, send down your Holy Spirit so that we can do all of the things that have been outlined in this psalm. We thank you and praise you for Jesus, our great high priest. May we be all the more thrilled and honoured to know that we love him, trust him and worship him. Bless us this morning. Bless us this afternoon. Bless us as we watch this service. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing, And Can It Be?
we pray again? Heavenly Father, we need these great encouragements, that thrill of saying, and can it be that I should gain an interest in a Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Lord, what thrilling words, because they capture who we are. But Lord, we also remember that we struggle, we suffer. That psalm at the beginning reminded us that you have to rescue us from anguish, from death. You have to hear our cries of pain for mercy. Lord, I know that there's somebody in the congregation who's been through a major operation this week. I just pray for your healing on her. I pray for your strength your mercy, your grace. I pray that she would be encouraged, that she would know that she's loved. Oh, Heavenly Father, in the midst of all of her trials and tribulations, bring her healing and bring her home soon. Have mercy on her. I know that another couple in the congregation have had their job taken away from them. And it's bewildering why this should happen to them now didn't seem to be a matter of money. It just seemed to be, oh dear, they're a little bit too old now. Let's retire them. And it just seems so unjust. Dear Lord, please have mercy on them. Give them encouragement. Let them know that they are still gloriously gifted and there are still many, many things that they can do to advance your kingdom and to bring blessing to many people. Be their rock, their strength and their encouragement. I know that others are struggling, Lord, with loneliness, with ill health. Others are struggling with doubts. Others are struggling over worry for their loved ones and their families. Hear our prayers, dear Lord, for them. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that we have encouragement that the uh, end of the lockdown seems to be in sight. Help us, dear Lord, to love you and to worship you and to keep trusting you. If we can uh, return to public worship, I pray, dear Lord, that we would do so in safety and joyously. Oh, give us strength and encouragement at this difficult time. Be especially close to those who it would be unwise for them to come out. I know that they'll be deeply disappointed, that they'll feel neglected or feel left out or they feel frustrated. Lord, give them your strength and consolation. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue our worship now as we sing this next song, Arise, My Soul, Arise. A wonderful song that just reminds us of the boldness with which we can approach the throne of grace, knowing that we're coming to a heavenly high priest who loves us and forgives us. Will you sing this with me? Arise, my soul, arise. Ever lives a 
We're going to turn now to Hebrews chapter 7. As I said at the beginning of the service, I believe that my calling as a preacher is to preach through whole books of the Bible. It's called expository preaching. And the reason I believe that that's so important is that God speaks to us through the whole of the Word of God. And it's not up to me to skip the boring parts or the parts that are awkward or the parts that don't really make sense or the parts that uh, make it seem strange or alien in our culture. In fact, those are the parts of the Bible that we most need preached because often that's where the devil will attack most powerfully. So we te- treat the whole of the Word of God with great reverence and respect. We long to hear from him. And so we're tackling this glorious book of the book of Hebrews. We're going to start at chapter 7, verse 20. But before we do so, we always pray because we need the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to us through this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you speak to us through this, your Word, but we need that divine presence of the Holy Spirit to convince us of these glorious truths. Do so now, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a little bit of background. The writer of the Hebrews is trying to persuade these first century Christians that they've left the Jewish faith, They've left behind a lot of things that brought them comfort, but they've come to something far, far better. And it's not novel, it's not strange, it's not alien to the Old Testament, rather it's fulfillment of the whole of the Old Testament. It may not be the familiar ways, but it's something better. And so he's introduced Melchizedek. Melchizedek, this strange, mysterious priest and king in, he, in Genesis chapter 14. Talked about him in Psalm 110 as well. We read all about that last week. And now he's talking about the Levitical priesthood. And it wasn't without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. In other words, the Levitical priests became priests because they were born into the right family. They weren't elected to the position. They weren't chosen by common uh, vote. They didn't buy their way into it. They didn't sit an exam to find out if they were best qualified for it. It wasn't because of their moral character or anything else. They just happened to be born into the right family. So those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Melchizedek, the king of kings and priest of priests, this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, Quoting Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. You can imagine how powerful that is. That God would swear an oath that he would make the fulfillment of Psalm 110 an eternal priest. Far, far superior to anything that was in the house of Aaron and among the Levitical priests. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. In other words, the Levitical priesthood, year after year, generation after generation, they would die. The wages of sin is death. It was an imperfect priesthood. But he, the Lord Jesus Christ, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he did not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, And then for the sins of the people, he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. I don't know what image comes into your mind when you think of a priest, especially a high priest. 
Maybe you're familiar with the Orthodox tradition and you think of these glorious, splendid robes and the unusual hats that they wear. Or maybe you're familiar with the Roman Catholic tradition or the Anglican tradition where you think of high priests as being something like bishops or popes. And you think of splendid costumes and glory and honour and prestige. Well, that's something of it, but we must take our minds off that type of priest and put our minds back into the first century and to think a little bit more carefully about what the original readers, the Hebrew readers, the Hebrew Christians living in the first century, while the temple was still standing, as they had been separated from that, as they had been cast out of the synagogues, as they had been rejected by their fellow Jews because they had accepted Jesus as their Messiah. They had, were shaken to the core. But they were very, very familiar with things that we're no longer familiar with. They were familiar with the duty of the high priest. And the high priest had this glorious privilege. He was allowed to go into the holy place, and once a year he was allowed to go into the holy of holies. He was the representative of all of the people, and he had to represent all of the people of Israel in the presence of God in the temple place of astonishing beauty and prestige, a place of pilgrimage and devotion, a place that drew people from across the Roman Empire. But let's think about the role of a high priest in the Old Testament. He was dressed in very splendid clothes, each and every detail from the color of the undergarments and the color of the shawl and the color of the smock and the color of the turban and the, and the very stones that were in the breastplate. Each and every one of them was prescribed by God himself. It must be this way, this shape, this color, this way, and no other way. And so his entire costume was one of perfect obedience to God. He couldn't be the faithful representative of the people of God if he ignored the instructions from God about how he should dress. But he had several roles. He has five important roles. The first one, surprisingly, wasn't as important as you would think it would be. It was a role of teaching. As the representative of the people before God. He had the duty before the God to teach the people. But we learn very little about great preachers in the Bible who were also high priests. Sadly, that didn't seem to be a major priority, especially in the time of Jesus. But also, the high priest had this glorious privilege of being able to go day by day into the holy place, the first annex as you walk through those mighty doors. That was something that other priests were allowed to do as well. But almost 99% of Israel and everybody who believed in the one true God was unable to enter that holy place. They were unable to go up the temple steps to the narthex, to the very centre of the faith. They were unable to see the menorahs and the table of incense and the table of showbread. Uh, they were unable to worship God, and so it was the high priest's duty to represent them all and to go into that place of special privilege. But inside it was amazingly dark. There was very little light. Those enormous doors trapped tra 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 out everything. There weren't great big windows to let light in. And so the only light in there was coming from the menorahs. And there the high priest had to pray, to pray on behalf of all of the people of God. So he had a duty of teaching and of prayer and of communion. There was a table of showbread there. And there, on behalf of all the people, he could eat of the showbread. And he could partake of a meal with God himself on behalf of the people. And there he could bring blessing to the people. If he, as the representative of the people, if all the people had been faithful under the old covenant system, then blessing would come to the people. If they'd been unfaithful, then there would be terrible consequences. But he had that ability and responsibility to bring blessing to the people of God. And finally, on Yom Kippur, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, he would go into the Holy of Holies. A great big curtain that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies would be opened up, and there would be the tabernacle 
The odds are that by the time that Jesus was alive, the tab the not the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, probably by Jesus' time, was long lost. I, th I imagine it was disappeared when the, um, when the Babylonians destroyed the temple. But nevertheless, they had to go in there in obedience and offer blood, blood sacrifice, once a year to make the people of God right with God. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, the Bible says. And so year by year, he would try to offer up forgiveness. But there was much darkness in this. Physically, there was much darkness in the temple itself with just those lamps there. But there was also much darkness because they didn't fully understand the importance of what they were doing. They didn't understand that it was pointing to something far, far more important than themselves. And so as we think about the ministry of Jesus, as we think about his priesthood, we need to understand that the priesthood of Jesus is more spiritual than anything in the Old Testament system. Hebrews chapter 12, 22 will go on to tell us that you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. For some reason, Christians today get very excited about earthly Jerusalem and they get very excited about the possibility of the rebuilding of an earthly temple. And I have no idea why that would be a passion for them. It seems mysterious to me because the book of Hebrews is always pointing us away from that earthly establishment and that earthly city. Sadly, that city was ultimately cursed by God. It was destroyed by the Romans. But praise God. This heavenly Jerusalem has never been destroyed. The city of God, the uh, glorious Mount Zion that's in heaven, is a beautiful, beautiful, unchanging. If you've ever fl flown in an aeroplane and looked down, you can sometimes look down on top of the clouds and if you've got these beautiful individual fluffy white clouds, you can sometimes see the shadow of the clouds on the ground. The shadows obviously are the, an outline of the shape of the cloud. They're just two-dimensional. The cloud itself is beautiful and complex and three-dimensional. The shadow is dark. The cloud itself captures all of the sunlight before it reaches the earth. The cloud is splendid, it's glorious, it's amazing. The shadow is dark, and, but it's got the faithful outline of the cloud itself. And that's how it is with the Old Testament. The, the uh, Old Testament has the outline of shadows. The heavenly reality is far, far more beautiful. And we need to remember that because Jesus' priesthood is spiritual. We remember that heavenly Zion. And so Jesus from his heavenly Zion, he continues to teach the people of God. He uses ordinary people like me. He uses your own private devotions as you read the Bible. He uses good ministry, faithful Bible teaching that you might find online. He uses all of these different things. But he speaks to us with complete authority in the word of God. And that's why every sermon we always begin with prayer. Every time we read the Bible, we begin with prayer because we need that miraculous encounter with him. We want to be taught by our great high priest and he speaks with clarity and authority through the word of God. But our heavenly high priest also is a ministry of prayer. He ever lives to intercede for you and me. He is constantly praying for your well-being and my well-being. He's praying that we would resist temptation. He was praying for forgiveness when we let ourselves down and let God down and let other people down. He's praying for mercy. He's praying for strength in the midst of trials. He ever lives to intercede for us. He's praying for you and for me, even when we're prayerless. Even when we feel that we have no prayers left, the intercession of Jesus continues on and on and on forever. What a glorious thing that is. And then we have communion. Just as the high priest could eat that heavenly bread, so Jesus invites us into a heavenly meal. This is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the idea on Monday, Thursday and on Good Friday to have 
communion again, to gather round the Lord's table and to feast again on Jesus, to find that glorious satisfaction for our souls that can be found nowhere else, to find the reality, to feast on Jesus. But Jesus brings us blessing, glorious, life-changing blessing, strength and hope and peace that only is found in him and his ministry. And finally, we have in his heavenly ministry, as our great high priest, we have guaranteed forgiveness, not just once a year on Yom Kippur, not just on the Day of Atonement, not just with a whole series of signs and ifs and buts and maybes, has Israel's sins for being forgiven or not? It's difficult to tell. No, we have the glorious three-dimensional, beautiful heavenly reality, the guaranteed forgiveness of sins for all who repent, all who lay their lives before Jesus, ask for strength to live a new life that's pleasing to him, that glorious delight that our sin has been dealt with, we've been made right with God. And so we rejoice. Again and again we rejoice that we have forgiveness through him. And so we have in Jesus a better priesthood than anything that was available to God's people under the Old Testament system. In the Old Covenant, it was all shadows and darkness. In the New Covenant, in the New Testament, it is all light and three-dimensional, life-changing reality. It's a beautiful thing. And so the priesthood of Jesus is more effective than anything that the Old Testament had to offer. I was reading a Bible commentary by uh, Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry lived two or three hundred years ago. But he wrote, The Levitical priesthood brought nothing to perfection. It could not justify men's persons from guilt. It could not sanctify them from inward pollution. It could not cleanse the consciences of worshippers from dead works. All that it could do was point them to Christ. And just like a signpost is never the destination, the signpost points you towards the destination. So in the Old Testament system, with the temple, And with the priesthood and with the sacrifices that were there, they were all just signposts pointing towards the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry continues, But the priesthood of Christ brings a better hope. It shows us the true foundation of all the hope we have towards God for pardon and salvation. It more clearly discovers the great object of our hope, Jesus. And so it tends to work in us, a more strong and lively hope of acceptance with God. By this hope, we're encouraged to draw close to God, to enter into a covenant union with him, to live a life of prayer and communion with him. We may now draw near with a true heart, with a full assurance of faith, having our minds sprinkled from a defiled conscience. And so we can approach Jesus because he has this better priesthood. But the priesthood of Jesus is more free. I talked about the garments of the priest, the high priest especially. He had to be dressed in a very precise way because everything was tightly controlled and regulated because God himself had revealed exactly how he had wanted to be worshipped. But we don't have endless complex details given to us in the New Testament. And so we have much greater liberty. And so as a result of that, we have lots of different rich traditions in the Christian church. And our tradition is different from theirs. And we disagree with one another in exactly what the meaning is and what the priority is and how we should do it. But we can do that knowing that we have greater freedom than the people of God had under the old covenant system. I love visiting churches and uh, when I was younger and free and I could go out by myself, one of the the great loves that I had was cycling out into the countryside and visiting uh, little country churches that are often still open. What a blessing it is to visit those parish churches in small villages. Uh, I travelled a lot around Europe and I saw many of the churches there as well. And uh, I I must admit, uh, many of the cathedrals are very beautiful, they're very ornate, but I never really got the Baroque style 
of churches. It just to me, it seems overwhelming. It seems a bit kitsch and vulgar. Just, there's just so busy. There's so much stuff that's going on there. I've never had the privilege of visiting an Orthodox cathedral or church, uh, but uh, I've seen many, many photos. And again, they're just overwhelming in their beauty and their complexity. But again, it just seems a little bit too overwhelming, a bit too busy. There's just too much going on, too many details. Uh, it's not quite what touches my heart. But then again, when I go to an Eng English cathedral, just where everything has been stripped laid, all has been made plain and simple. One of the controversial things that happened in, our, in English history was the Reformation, and with the Reformation was the stripping of the altars. And many of the churches had their stained glass windows removed, others had the statues removed, and that's been ugly in some places, but in my opinion, I think that many of those cathedrals are far more beautiful for all the white, clear light that comes into them. And to me, they just seem more intensely spiritual. Without all of that busyness and distraction, it means that we can concentrate on the inward relationship with God. And so our own building behind us isn't very complex. It's not beautiful. It's not ornate. It's not uh, anything like the photos we've seen. But it doesn't have those distractions. So it means that we can worship inwardly. We can lift our hearts through our imaginations and our spirits into the very throne room of heaven. And rather than seeing a mere shadow on earth, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can taste and experience something more of the heavenly Jerusalem. I'm sure that our Catholic and our Orthodox and our Anglican friends experience the presence of God in different ways. But isn't it wonderful that God has given us greater freedom to explore him and find him in so many different ways. If we look again at other traditions, we can see that we have an enormous amount in, in common with them, a teaching ministry, a ministry of prayer, a ministry of communion as we meet round the, uh, the Lord's table. The, uh, uh, we celebrate with the bread and the wine. Some traditions call it communion, some call it the Eucharist, some call it the Mass. But we long to meet with Jesus around that and have communion with him. We long to receive blessing. We long to know that we're forgiven. And each and every one of these traditions unites around that priestly ministry. But for us, not being Orthodox, not being Catholic, not being Anglican, for us, we look to the Word of God. And there in 1 Peter... Chapter 2, verse 5, it says, You yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is enough. It's good. It's blessing. It is rich and glorious when we experience it. And so we're a little bit more boring and plain to the outward eye. But our feasting on Christ is just as precious, just as deep, just as rich. And we long for the true reality. One of the great sadnesses, of course, that we've read about for, for our Catholic friends has been the child abuse uh, um, uh, scandals that afflicted the church through the uh, 1990s and the early 2000s as one allegation and one revelation after another came out. And the great sadness was made worse when some of the hierarchy tried to cover it up or explain it away. It was dealt with. It was investigated. Some went to jail. Others lost their jobs. And praise God, I think they've learned their lessons, but no denomination can afford to be complacent about this. And I don't use the Catholic Church to sneer at them because as the world looks at what happened to the Catholic Church, they make no distinction. They assume that if it can happen in the Catholic Church, it can happen in a Protestant church, it can happen in an independent church, it can happen in an Anglican church, and we're all tarred with the same brush. The name of Christ is dishonored throughout, and so we all mourn together at this terrible thing. But together our hearts also go out to the victims, the victims who have suffered so much at the hands of men that ought to have
been trusted, ought to have been men of integrity and beyond all of that. Just in the interests of fairness, I do need to point out that um, uh, Philip Jenkins, he was a, he's a, a Baptist scholar um, at Baylor University in the United States. Uh, he's not a Catholic, but he did a lengthy investigation into paedophilia and priests and ultimately he concluded that roughly um, uh, the same proportion of men in the, in the Catholic ministry have abused children as men outside of the Catholic ministry. This just seems to be an aberration among a tiny minority of men that they would want to do these horrible things to children. And so children are not more at risk in a Catholic church. And they're not more at risk in any other church. But they, the th mere threat of these things should make us all the more diligent to make sure that all of our children are protected and safe from any possibility of this type of thing happening to them. But I only say all of these things to point out that human beings are imperfect. I'm a sinner. Every Catholic priest is a sinner. Every Orthodox priest, every Anglican priest is a sinner. We all fall short of the glory of God. We are not to be trusted 100%. Only Jesus is, because only Jesus is perfect. Only Jesus is pure. And so verse 26 says, such a high priest meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. I don't hear confession of sins. That's a different thing that the Catholic Church does, but um, I can understand why there may be something that you wouldn't want to tell me something that you feel too embarrassed about, something that um, you would feel too ashamed to confess to another human being. But you have a heavenly high priest who is holy, blameless, pure, and set apart from sinners. And he will never betray you. He will never betray a confidence. He will never abuse you. He will never, ever exploit his position for his own interests. Rather, he's a sympathetic high priest. And so, whatever you've experienced, whatever sadness you've been through, Jesus understands. Jesus can be trusted. Jesus can be depended on because he is holy, blameless, pure, and set apart from sinners. Unlike other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day, for his, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Just as the Old Testament priests need for constant forgiveness of sins, so under the New Testament, priests in different denominations, pastors in my denomination and my tradition, we need constant forgiveness. We are imperfect but we all point people towards Jesus. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. The law appoints high priests, men who are weak. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. That's glorious because it means that the priesthood of Jesus is unchangeable. In verse 24 it says that he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. We don't need a new temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem because we have direct access to the heavenly reality. We don't need a new priesthood. We don't need all of these other things because we have Jesus as our priest. And although I do many of the things that a priest may do, I, although I may administer the, uh, the Lord's table, although I may preach the word of God, I know that there's other mature men in our congregation that do the same thing because we're a priesthood of believers. But we're all juniors. We're all here merely with delegated responsibility because Jesus is the perfect great high priest. But finally, the priesthood of Jesus is effective. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession 
for them. And so let me leave you with that wonderful thought. Jesus is able to save you to the uttermost. When you're feeling weak, when you're feeling doubtful, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling uh, full of self-pity, when you're feeling prayerless, Jesus is still able to save you to the uttermost. When your loved ones are elderly and their mind is no longer as strong as it once was, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. Jesus ever lives to intercede for you and me. He's praying for you and for me right now. He's praying for strength to overcome those trials. He's praying for mercy. He's praying for grace. He's praying for forgiveness. And he never, ever stops in that eternal ministry because Jesus is your ever faithful high priest. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for King Jesus. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you have had mercy on us. We pray, dear Lord, that you would continue to give us access to that glorious ministry of our great High Priest Jesus. Lift our hearts into heaven and help us to always rejoice in what we have in Jesus. Thank you, dear Lord, that we have a more spiritual, more effective, more free, pure, unchangeable and effective High Priest in Jesus. Thrill our hearts again with this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's really only one song that we can sing at the end of that, and that's Before the Throne of God Above. Will you say the grace with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Here's a challenge for you. If you're able to log into YouTube, leave a comment underneath. Tell me about what it means for you to have Jesus as your great high priest. Tell me something about the consolation that it brings or how it's helped you in, in, at, so, at some stage. It'd be lovely to have a conversation with you in the comments section. Thank you for all of you that like the, like the service. Thank you for all of you that have subscribed as well. All of these things help YouTube to promote it. And it's wonderful that more people are 
uh, hearing about Jesus. And ex the ministry of Parkside has been extended beyond these walls. So let's give thanks to God. And until next week, may God richly bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.